Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. And Christopher also asked me to speak about somebody who I knew and loved. I was fortunate to have known Sherman Parker. I had the honor of serving with him in the State Senate while he was in the House. And I confess, I, I didn't know him as well as my husband did. Uh, my husband tried to have lunch with him just about, you know, periodically to catch up with him. And, but he knew, I knew him well enough to, knew, to know what was inside him. And, and now some of you all out there are probably thinking, now why is a two-term member of the Missouri House an important figure? And why should a scholarship be in his name? And why should we remember him? And it's, it's easy. It's easy. We knew what his dreams were, and we knew what he cared about. And it is his spirit that we rem remember and honor, and that can pr provide us all with inspiration and hope that things don't have to stay the same. We can change the country for the better. And we can change the Republican Party for the better. So what you have to really remember was that Sherman knew what it was to be on the outside of the club. Now, do, you, do most of you all know what the club is? You know, the club is the power brokers. The, they're, they're the, some might call them the good old boys. Some might call them they, they who control everything. And I know many of you understand this better than me. But I do think that as an African-American, Sherman found it easier to recognize when the club is no longer working for all of us, when it is just working for the members of the club. Now, a lot of people get elected, and when they find out the club is hard, is, is hard sometimes impossible to change, they give up, and they just try to be part of the club, unfortunately part of the problem. And if I could digress for a minute, I think that is what has happened in Washington, D.C. today. We elect folks who buy into the dinners and the wine and the glamour and the power, and they only want to be a part of the club. They end up saying things like, um, oh, I'm a go-along, get-along kind of guy. But that was not Sherman Parker. That was not Sherman Parker. You know, people who don't know the whole story will tell you the most remarkable thing about Sherman's first election uh, to state rep from St. Charles County was that he was African American. Well, that's not right. The truth is, the truth is when, when Sherman was elected in 2002, the St. Charles County Republican Party was very hierarchical. It was very establishment. Nobody had even heard of the Tea Party then. Nobody took on the establishment and won. Sherman took on the establishment and won. And Sherman never quit challenging the status quo. He never quit trying to change the Republican Party. Now Sherman and I had our, our own differences sometimes, but I knew that when Sherman took a position, it was because he thought it was the right position. He never worried about his membership in the club. And let's face it, let's face it, I'm just speaking plainly to y'all tonight. When the truth is, when you're a black Republican, or a woman for that matter, membership in the club can be very precarious. Sherman was a true conservative, but he knew that whenever he took a position that wasn't the accepted position, he would be doubted faster and harder than others. And he risked even getting kicked out of the club. I'll just tell you all, I got kicked out of the club a long time ago, but uh, Sherman, Sherman talked to me and my husband David many, many times about his dreams and vision. He understood that a conservative approach to governing, a limited government, a free market, personal responsibility, and freedom enables African Americans more opportunity. But that was easy. That was the approved party line. He never quit trying to get the Republican Party, the bosses, the big guys at the top, to understand the obligation that a political party that professes to want to reach out to black Americans owes it to the community and the culture they want to reach. In other words, reaching out cannot mean waiting until an election year to run your radio ads on the right stations or go to the right dinners 
We can't just talk about the importance of economic development to the city of St. Louis and forget about North St. Louis. We as Republicans need to understand the different challenges and the decreased opportunities of people who are not as readily accepted into the club and do something about it. That's what made Sherman unique and different. Sherman believed in the idea that the country can be much greater if it is run for the good of everybody and not just for a few elite. Everybody knew Sherman held on to that belief and practiced it. And at least to me, from the outside looking in, it's what, why the black community never begrudged Sherman his choice of the Republican Party. And what made Sherman different was that he also held the deep belief that the way to include and work for the good of all wasn't the traditional democratic idea of more government. Sherman believed in capitalism, the power of the free market, and in liberty and in freedom and the promise it holds for all of us. He just believed that for those principles to work that they had to be applied equally for everyone. That's why he was such a champion of education, because he understood that a quality education would bring opportunity and prosperity to areas like North St. Louis. He fought for it, not only because it was right, he fought for it to give a voice to the people who had no voice. Now, you know, today there's a lot of talk about leadership, or lack of it, in politics. I taught a class down at Missouri State University in, in leadership and change a couple years ago. And it was a class that I put together uh, myself. And I, what I did was I, I put it together on the premise that we need to be teaching our kids that we can't leave change up to somebody else. We can't, we can't expect government to just step in. You can't rely on that. And you can't assume somebody else is going to do it. You have to decide that you're going to do it. You're going to make a difference. If you want to make something happen, it's going to be up to you. Ronald Reagan said, a leader, once convinced a particular course of action is the right one, must have the determination to stick with it and be undaunted when the going gets rough. Now that's a lot easier said than done, as we all know. And we talked about a lot of leaders in my class. But there are two of my favorites, and I think it's because they fought the establishment or the status quo of their time. Consider Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony. Frederick Douglass, a slave who earned the freedom and became an outspoken abolitionist, was not afraid to risk his life and speak out about the evils of slavery in a white world. In 1852, before the Civil War, he was asked to speak on the meeting of the 4th of July in Rochester, New York. Now you can imagine doing that if you were Frederick Douglass, standing up in front of a, a crowd of predominantly white businessmen, the establishment, and saying some of these words. And if you've never read that speech by him, you, you really should because it's outstanding. But just to paraphrase a little small part, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. There is not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. How many citizens would stand up today and openly call out the wrongdoing and injustices as he did right in their face, in their face. And now today, because he was unafraid to do that and others uh, were afraid to, weren't afraid to stand up then, 159 years later, we do have an African-American president. Susan B. Anthony wasn't afraid to buck the establishment and spent her life working to get women the right to vote. And in one single courageous act in 1872, she was arrested for voting. And you know what? The judge instructed the jury to find her guilty. Can you imagine that? You, that's, that's justice, huh? And remember, she did not see the change in her lifetime. The 19th Amendment passed in 1920, 14 years after she died. 
I asked my class what would have happened if she wouldn't have voted that day in 1872. And you know what they shockingly said? Somebody else would have done it. Really? Maybe, but maybe not. You know, I think deep down we're all motivated by wanting to make a difference. We want to make the world a little better place. Don't you? I, I know that's what motivates me, and I know, I know that's what motivated Sherman. Sherman was firmly committed to conservative principles because he knew that individual and economic freedom empowers people to pursue their dreams and prosper. Sherman, once he was convinced he was right, was a true leader that made a difference because he stuck with it even when that road got rough. And you know what? The going is always rough when you are standing on principle and fighting for people who don't have a voice. Thank you, Sherman. We miss you. And thank you all for having me here tonight.